Welcome to the seventh annual Dean W. Lytle Electrical Engineering Endowed Lecture Series. I'm John Saar, the Interim Department Chair. I'm glad you can join us for the department's premier annual event, which features internationally renowned researchers in the field of communications and signal processing. I'd like to start by thanking the Lytle Lectureship Committee for organizing this year's event, Professor Jenning Wang, Professor Louis Scharf, Professor Les Atlas, Dr. Bishnu Atal, Professor Mariam Fazel, Professor Jeff Bilms, and Pam Eisenheim and Brooke Fisher. Since we're in a classroom setting, I'll also warn you that the bell will ring once or twice. I'd like to share a few highlights about the department as we continue to be uh, the largest in the College of Engineering in terms of the number of students. We're the eighth largest producer of electrical engineering bachelor's degrees in the nation, about 180 degrees per year. Our faculty members continue to attract media attention for their research and inventions. You may have seen professors Matt Reynolds, Josh Smith, and Shwetak Patel in the news several times recently for their interventions in cell phone technology, wireless power transfer, and energy management. Also, Blake Hannaford and Howard Chiswick have been getting some nice press recently for their developments in robotics. To keep you up to date on our cutting edge facilities and technology, we do offer occasional tours once a quarter. We had a fun one this afternoon. I hope you'll come back and join us in the winter and in the spring. Last year, electrical engineering faculty were involved in five of the 17 startups that originated at the University of Washington. Key technologies for Google Glass originated in our department. And 2014 has been a strong year for innovation with two startup companies and 65 patent applications by our faculty and students. The Lytle Lecture Series honors the late Professor Dean W. Lytle, who began his career as an assistant professor at the UW in electrical engineering in 1958. Lytle received his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from UC Berkeley and his master's and PhD from Stanford University. Lytle's teaching and research focus was in communications, networks, probability, and signal processing. He authored two textbooks, and his consulting work included appointments at Boeing, Honeywell, and Bell Telephone. I would like to recognize Lytle's family members in the audience today. His wife, Marilyn, is here. His two daughters, Allison and Heidi, are here. And Allison's wife, uh, husband, uh, Steve, is here, here as well. Allison and Steve are both alums of our department. The Lytle Endowed Lecture Series was made possible through the collective fundraising effort of the Lytle family uh, and dean's uh, PhD student, Dr. Louis Scharf, who I see in the audience back here. They brought together alumni, friends, and colleagues to ra raise the funds for this fellowship. The ongoing efforts of Manaz Scherzoy and Kelly Williams in our advancement office also contribute to making this event a success. But now for the, the feature of our event today, I'm honored to welcome this year's Lytle lecture speaker, Dr. Arogya Swami Palraj. Dr. Palraj is an emeritus professor at Stanford University. He graduated with a PhD from the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi in 1973. Paul Rudge joined Stanford in 1992 after spending 25 years in the Indian Navy. During that time, he founded a th three national laboratories in India and led the development of a world-class sonar system for the Navy, and noted as one of the country's most successful military research and development projects. Paul Rudge proposed the concept of spatial multiplexing, multi-input, multi-output receivers in 1992, and MIMO technology is today a key to wireless broadband networks like 4G, cellular, and Wi-Fi. In 1999, Paul Raj founded IOSPAN Wireless Incorporated, which was acquired by Intel in 2003. And in 2004, Paul Raj co-founded the BSEM uh, Communications Incorporated, which became a market leader in 4G uh, WiMAX semiconductors, and which was in, uh, itself acquired by Broadcom in 2010. Paul Raj has received numerous recognition of his technical contributions, including the 2011 IEEE Alexander Graham Bell uh, Medal and the 2014 Marconi Prize and Fellowship. He's a member of seven national academies, including the US National Academy of Engineering. Please join me in welcoming Professor Aryo Swami Paul Raj. Thank you, John. Professor John Saar, <coughs> Professor <coughs> Louis Schaff, I can't see him, where, where is Louis? Uh, <coughs> I'm very honored to deliver the Professor Dean Lytle lecture. Uh, Dean was a highly respected faculty member at uh, University of Washington and in this department, 
and also I should add uh, a very uh, illustrious PhD from Stanford University. Uh, I'd like to join John in welcoming uh, Dean's wife, uh, Marilyn, and his family, Alison, uh, Heidi, and Steve. <coughs> Welcome. I was at the opportunity this morning to walk around the department labs, and, it's, uh, and I'm really amazed at the good work being done. So University of Washington is a very bright star in the firmament of engineering, and, uh, and, and I'm doing extremely well. <coughs> Congratulations. <coughs> I'm also indebted to Professor Louis Schaaf, uh, a man of very many great talents uh, who worked hard to make this lecture series possible. Thank you for inviting me and thinking of me. <coughs> My topic uh, today is about mobile wireless uh, evolution. And uh, I add the word personal perspective because this is such a giant area. It's in every, you know, it's in everyone's pocket and almost every human being on this earth. And uh, it's really a big thing with so many contributors and so many different technologies. So my perspective is going to be fairly narrow from the point of radio access and certainly also a personal perspective because I've only been a part of this huge, huge engine that made all this possible. <coughs> uh, <coughs> so, of course, uh, many years ago, we talked about anywhere, anytime, about wireless, but now it's wireless is everywhere, is everyone and is everything. Uh, certainly everywhere, but one can, from University of Washington, Washington uh, uh, students to Maasai tribesmen. And, uh, uh, so, and I think, in fact, at this point, we are, uh, we are at 95% penetration of world's population. There are probably no more subscribers left on this earth to, to, to catch. Uh, even Africa now is at 87% uh, penetration. So it's almost everywhere. And, uh, and uh, it's an amazing, amazing achievement. And of course, the, the mobile phone is becoming the center of lots of applications. So it's sort of begun to do everything. And certainly, there's a lot more to go there, but certainly already, it's uh, such a powerful tool in our pockets. Uh, and all this has happened in the last, really, last 30 years. It's an amazing growth, and I'll talk a little bit more about it in my, in my, in, in, as we go on. So it's really, uh, for the last 30 years, most of us have been alive 30 years ago. From almost nothing, this has happened, and it's such a transformative technology. <coughs> so it's been an incredible revolution. Uh, journey, and my hope today is to sort of take you through that journey, particularly on the point of radio, radio access, uh, and, uh, and also highlight uh, the, the, uh, the, the small role I played here and there in this, in this last, uh, in this huge revolution. So let me begin with the pi radio pioneers, and James Clark Maxwell, uh, who actually proposed the theory, he predicted that electromagnetic radiation exists by his famous equations. And it left, was left to Hendrik Hertz, who was an engineer in Germany, who actually died very young, at the age of 35, who demonstrated the, actually the, 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 demonstrated the presence of electromagnetic waves. But he didn't uh, commercialize it, certainly died very young. And it was uh, Guglielmo Marconi, at the almost age of 18, a very young age, uh, working in this uh, villa in Germany, who actually built the first telegraph, the wireless telegraph. And, uh, and of course, he, if, uh, if Maxwell was a theoretician, uh, Hertz did the experiments, Marconi was an entrepreneur, and he took the telegraph and made it into a worldwide phenomena. And uh, it's sort of that uh, we, we have today's uh, revolution in wireless. <coughs> and uh, it's worth noting that, uh, that uh, uh, Marconi uh, went from something like 200, 150 feet in, in 1895, in 1895 in, uh, in Bologna in Italy to 1,500 miles of reach in, by 1902, just a matter of seven years. It's almost 500% compound annual growth in range. So when you talk about progress today as being as stunning, it's probably even more stunning in those days. <clears throat> and, uh, and of course, the early radios were called spark gap radios. They're very, very broadband. And then by, by 1920s, uh, radios became channelized. They, they, you could actually use them in a, in a fixed channel, so multiple channels were deployed. 
and uh, except for radio broadcast, which is well, most of uh, uh, became a public thing for everybody to listen to radio broadcasts, radio communications one to one was really mostly for the government and for uh, police and some, it was, never was a mass market uh, technology. That happened only, began to happen only many years later, perhaps almost 70 years later, in the 19, 1960s and 70s, people began to think about it. So, uh, <clears throat> so the idea of channelized radio living within a fixed band was, was known by 1920s and actually used in the, second, the first and second world war uh, by 1960s, there was obviously demand for, uh, the police began to use some of these ideas in Chicago in 1935, but the demand for businessmen to sort of use this uh, mobile telephony came around 1960s, and AT&T fielded a couple of systems called the MTS, Mobile Telephone System, and the IMTS, the Improved Mobile Telephone System. And typically they had about 50 to 100 channels available of spectrum given to them of FCC, and they could support 50 to 100 calls per city. So it was actually, uh, it, was a, it, it was useful, but very limited service because uh, you only had that much of spectrum. So one needed a, a breakthrough, and the breakthrough came, uh, so you need to scale now to tens of thousands if you want it to be a, to be, to be a larger service. And, uh, uh, and the idea came uh, to two, two uh, uh, researchers that Bell Labs, I'll mention the names later, but the idea was, was you take the available spectrum and divide that into, say, say three pieces. So you have one third, per, per, three pieces of uh, equal value each. And then build a, uh, you know, build a, what's called a cluster. A cluster in this case is three cells, red, green, and let's say it's blue, one, two, and three. And then give each of the cluster, each point in the cluster or each cell one third the spectrum. Then repeat this, this cluster again and again and add infinitum to cover the city. So, and then what would happen is that every, for every red cell, for example, you would have the same frequency again and again and again. But because uh, the, uh, the, the, the phone in the cell would be at, at, at most the distance radius R away, radius of the cell away, the nearby co-channel interference from the neighboring cells would be some distance, guaranteed distance away. You would be able to control the interference to this thing. And uh, uh, in this case, the cluster, cluster size of three meant that uh, you would have actually uh, around the, let's say, the red, red cell over on the right, you would have six cells interfering with it, but they all would be at least a uh, distance of one cell away, so it would have controlled interference. So that was the idea that was uh, called the idea of cellular reuse. So you're reusing the frequency again and again so you could serve a huge population. The other idea, was actually was idea of a handover. Uh, well, because if you're in a mobile car you're mo and you're walking or moving across the city, you would only remain in a cell for some time and you have to, you'll have to move into another cell. And obviously, you must, uh, another cell has a new frequency and a new base station. So you've got to switch over your, your circuit from the previous base station to the new base station and change your frequency. That was called the handover. And typically the handover was that you sort of, you realize you've got to do it, then you at least, you break circuit on one cell and you connect the circuit on the right cell. So these were the two key ideas called cellular reuse and handover. And all these things of course still being used today and uh, today when handover takes place, it's pretty complicated. Millions of pieces of data are flown between, move, move between the phone and the base station to make these things reliable. So these were the two key ideas which are the loud scaling to tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, to millions, and now billions of people. And uh, uh, I should mention that uh, there is an issue, interesting issue in, in the problem of cellular reuse. If you have, a, say, a cluster size of three, that means you have you know, one third the frequency uh, uh, of the available bandwidth, uh, then you would find that you would have uh, your, the neighboring interferers are reasonably close. But if you now decide to have larger cluster sizes where you have less bandwidth per cell, uh, for example, in this case, seven, you'll have a cluster of seven cells. Then the nearest co-channel cell is further out. You still have six of them, but they're further out. You will have less interference. So, so therefore, if you have more bandwidth per cell, which is nice, because you want maximum bandwidth available, you, order, you buy the bandwidth at extremely high cost from, from FCC, 
you want to use all of it in every cell, but you cannot in, in this by this diagram. But more bandwidth you put in a cell, the more interference you're going to have. So this, this issue was a key issue, and this drove the evolution of 1G and 2G and 3G were all driven by this particular idea, and I'll explain why. So who are the pioneers of these basic concepts? Uh, there were three people, Douglas Ring, again from Stanford University, I should say, uh, uh, W.R. Ray Young, and uh, so they actually proposed the basic ideas of, of cellular reuse, wrote some papers and patents, and they did some experiments along with Dr. Jakes, who was a big, uh, big person in, in, in propagation, but they never built any hardware. There was not enough technology at Bell Labs those days to sort of demonstrate all this. Back, this is back in 19, I think uh, Ring's first paper was 1947, so way back in uh, 47. And uh, it was actually later in the 60s and 70s that Amos Joel actually built a system, and he actually really made the handover problem possible. Handover is very complicated. It's easy to see, to talk about it in this way, uh, switching over, but it turns out that, uh, that uh, uh, radio propagation is, very, is, is anything but simple. And you see a lot of surprises. You might find this, uh, a, a given cell is powerful, but you get close to it, it becomes weaker again. So there's lots of technology needed to make it reliable. So Joel actually made, worked on that and made it possible. So he's highly recognized. He's got probably every possible award in communications in, in technology in the world. He's got the National Medal of Technology. Uh, you know, he's, the found, he's got the uh, Medal of Honor, the Bell Medal, the Marconi. Is, I think he's also recognized by the Marconi Society for Achievement Award and uh, the Kyoto Prize and so on and so forth. So because he actually ran the engineering group to demonstrate the cellular concept and, and the handover. <clears throat> So before I go on to the evolution of the system per proper, let me talk about uh, the idea of signal interference. So if you're sending a digital signal, what you would just say, you have bits one, zero, zero, one, zero, you would have a smooth waveform where you would sort of, you would exactly at the timing point, the synchronized clock point, go through one or minus one, minus one, one, and minus one, so on and so forth. So a, a cell tower down there would be transmitting that to a cell phone it would send those bits one zero one zero zero one zero, but you know you have the interference from other cells, so that's the the difference is small. Uh, it's not, it's unable to change the decision because as long as in this decision making over here on top, as long as the level is above one, above zero, you would choose a one, or below zero you would choose a zero, uh, below zero you would choose a zero. But uh, for small perturbations of this by noise, by interference is okay. But the interference was very strong, then it could flip your bits and you make an error. So the point of this diagram was uh, interference was a problem, but you had to keep it controlled to make it actually work. And, uh, and, uh, and we know that interference power was linked to the reuse issues, and that dynamics was an important one. <clears throat> so to go further, uh, suppose uh, I, I do a log plot, so uh, here every, every step would mean a factor of 10 and not, it's not linear. So if some, let's say you have some signal level that's available to you uh, at the edge of a cell. I have interference coming in from nearby, and that's the level there. And that's, just, that's an acceptable level to get reliable decoding. But in fact, what happens is in, in wireless propagation, we have the problem of variability, or something called fading. The signal is rarely, uh, is never at the level it's supposed to be. It's, it's got a mean level but it moves above the level and also moves below the level. Technically, infinitely, it can go all the way to infinite power. Never happens, of course. It can also go all the way down to zero. So it fades up and down, and typically the fading is called Rayleigh fading. And, uh, and the interference is coming from, uh, from your co-channel cell is also fading, of course, fading above the level and below the level. And this makes life difficult because you want to guarantee that the signal to interference gap is maintained, at, let's say, from the earlier plot of like, 6 dB or factor of four, factor of 10, you've got to push down the interference down to a sufficient small level so that you have this gap. But the gap can never be guaranteed at 100% because then we'll have to push it all the way down to zero. So you know, you're only looking for some kind of reliability, let's say 95%. At the 95% reliability, you still have to push down the interference level, acceptable interference level, so that you still have a reasonable call. So it really means is that you've got to push out, make the cluster size larger and push out the co-channel cells. So the, the, therefore, if you want to therefore get to more, more bandwidth per cell, which is what you want to do, you've got to compress 
their variability. It turned out the compression of the variability drove the 1, 2, and 3G technologies. 4G took a little different turn, but uh, not a very much different turn. So I just try to explaining this at some, at some uh, level of detail. So now we come to the first G system called AMPS. Or it developed a, also called NMT in Europe. It had different names in Europe. It had the name, I think, forget in Japan, but TAX in UK. So there are very many systems which look very much like the AMP system, the first generation. And it sort of was first began deployed, actually deployed to commercial use only in 1983. It was developed way before, way before that, but before AT&T made up its mind to deploy it, it took some time. <clears throat> and um, and uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, the actual uh, the target of the deployment was actually car phones for business people, so executives with car phones. And uh, it's interesting that in 1884, when they deployed the system, AT&T asked uh, Anderson Consulting to do an estimate of the number of expected f mobile phone users by year 2000. And they expected, they, uh, they said it will not be more than a million, million such phones. But we know by year 2000, we were already 100 million. So, so, so much for consulting firms, they, they got it wrong by a factor of 100 times. <clears throat> so that's the first 1G, or the called AMP system, Advanced Mobile Phone System. And, um, and uh, it were, because it had because the inherent variability of interference and signal, and they didn't have much, many ways to combat it, they had to keep the interference really low. So their cluster size was 21, that means if we had a certain available bandwidth, you have to go down to almost five, less than 5% of spectrum per cell. It means about capacity per cell is very small in order to make it work. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a cluster size of 21. And, um, and uh, they used analog FM technology. Digital has, wasn't quite mature at that time. And uh, they used a technique called frequency division multiple axis. So once you had a certain amount of spectrum available to the carrier and you got a spectrum per cell, you would divide that into channels and each channel was given a unique frequency, that's what's called FDMA, frequent division multiple access, and each channel was one phone call. So that channel could be shared among multiple people as people make, and, you know, make calls and get off, the, get off the system, but that was the concept of FDMA. And this was uh, fielded by Bell Labs, uh, developed by Bell Labs. Uh, those, I'm not sorry, AT&T, I shouldn't say Bell Labs. AT&T, Ericsson was a player, NTT, Docomo and LTT in Japan, and many others. And almost uh, around the 1980s, many countries in the world deployed this analog system. In the US, we call it AMPS. <clears throat> Uh, around that time when, the, uh, when, when AMPS came in, uh, uh, the uh, two sort of, uh, one phone had appeared earlier called basically the, called, called the, uh, a phone which is a large piece of electronics in the trunk of the car, and, uh, or sometimes in a bag, a heavy bag, and you could take that into your car and then connect it to the power supply of the car and then make a call. Uh, you had a typical black tap handset with a, with a curl, curl rod. This is how it was first deployed. But uh, Marty Cooper, uh, was then also an, was was the vice president at Motorola, uh, had developed a phone, uh, a hand phone, hand phone, uh, 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 called DynaTAC. And TAC, I think, some very almost ridiculous name, some total area, total adaptive coverage, or some such thing. But DynaTAC uh, was developed by Motorola and was sold for three thousand four hundred dollars. Uh, but but the car phone was early, used earlier in the IMTS and MTS system, so it's sort of well known but it's very bulky, but uh, the idea of going from a car phone to a handset was a big leap. And in fact, uh, Marty demonstrated the, the phone from Motorola in 1974, 10 years before it became a commercial product, because it took a long time before the network could be brought up and FCC gave the spectrum and so on and so forth. So 1984, because Dynatac was selling, and I was actually visiting Stanford for a couple of years, and I don't think I saw the phone, but I did meet Marty Cooper at that time. <clears throat> So, uh, so who were the pioneers of, uh, of 1G? Uh, uh, this is a, a famous photograph taken uh, last year when 
a bunch of them, I, I include, I've included one name, I'll include, mention later, got the Draper Prize for 2013. Uh, this is from the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, on the left is uh, Yoshinisho, Yoshinisho Okumura, who was a Japanese engineer who was a big pioneer of radio propagation studies. And many of us who work there have used the Okumura model. So he was recognized for his work on propagation, which is very complicated in wireless. And Joel Engel uh, and uh, Richard Frankel were the people who engineered the AMP system. They were the chief engineers of the AMP system, so they were recognized. And Marty Cooper, of course, from Motorola, Ben and Motorola, uh, was uh, recognized for the, for the cell phone. <clears throat> of course, Marty is very visible in the press these days. And uh, he actually got the Marconi Prize last year. And he was at, my, at the ceremony for this year with me in Washington. So now we go on to the second generation system called the GS, basically GSM. There were some other efforts of 2G uh, uh, around the world, but GSM finally really took off. It happened in the early 90s. They actually been working on it from 1982 to about 1988, I think. And, uh, and the, the motivation for that was Europe had different analog systems. There was one different Germany versus France versus Sweden. So Europeans said, you know, when business travelers would find they had to go to a, uh, go to a new country, which is this next, next door, they couldn't use their phones. And they probably had to carry six phones to be able to travel around. So they said, this looks ridiculous. Let's standardize on a single system. So that led to this uh, GSM uh, system, which is actually meant for General Society Mobile. Idea was to make it a universal system for Europe. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and that started the process for building GSM. <coughs> And uh, it was sort of began to be deployed around early 1992, but I think it came to US probably only around 95 or 96, fairly late. And uh, this system had a better job, did a better job of controlling the variability of signal and interference, certainly of the interference, by some technique called frequency hopping. So frequency hopping reduced the interference variability, and that allowed us to use, uh, make a smaller cluster, because you could allow uh, you could support, you could, you could uh, the, the reduce interference means that you can actually make the cluster smaller because you can bring the, you could bring the average ratios of signal to interference much lower. And the cluster size initially was nine. Now in GSM's progress so much over the last 20 years, now the cluster size is one. But those days it was nine. It is certainly much better than AMPs. It's a digital system. So it allowed lots of things about digital, including channel coding to come to place. And it uses the technique called time division multiple axis. The idea uh, was to go back here. If you, now you have a certain spectrum, you would have one ninth per, ca per cell because you have only nine factor of the cluster size. And that one ninth, uh, let's assume it's one channel, just channel was 200 kilohertz. They would build a 200 kilohertz modem, a fairly thick pipe, and they would time slice it among eight users. So the eight slots, and they would, the slot one would go to just one phone call, slot two, another phone call, and so on and so forth. And this allowed them to do many, many things, uh, and certainly gave them frequency hopping to reduce variability of interference, and also gave them some diversity or some reduction of signal variability also by some techniques. I, I won't go into they get complicated. But uh, the interesting thing about this was, this was a huge leap forward from AMP system. And uh, when I landed in Stanford earlier in this November 91, uh, it was clear that the United States and the FCC were shaken by what Europe had done. Europe was ticked, always generally seen ahead of US in communications, but this was a way leap forward. So uh, what FCC did was actually launch a, a, a concept called Pioneer's Preference. Really a pretty brain dead idea, I would say. Uh, even I also tried to take part in it. But what FCC said was they, would, they had a competition for a new wireless technology which would outcompete, outdo GSM. And the prize was the, the, the three top winners will get, each get an MTA, mobile, mobile trading area, like entire Los Angeles Basin or entire New York area, which is worth a billion dollars those days, not those days. And so this is, there was, and the hope was that venture capital will pour money to go after the big prize and, 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 uh, and try and demonstrate the technology. But what FCC never realized was, mobile telephone is all about global standards. You can't build something in a garage and sort of say, no, this is, this is better. 
an FCC is the world run by lawyers couldn't understand uh, difference between a good and a bad technology. So they gave the, the prize to all the wrong guys. <laughs> and, and the wrong guys had to, you know, when they got the money, they, had, they got the empty, they had to deploy their technology, which of course didn't work. And so, so I was involved with some of that politics, but finally, uh, you know, some people made the money, but uh, nevertheless, uh, I think none of those ideas have had, uh, never took off. So in Marty Cooper, uh, now is proposing the same idea now, I've been telling FCC, don't do it because it doesn't work. Because uh, certainly lawyers should be picking technologies. And uh, uh, so that was the story of GSM. And that was, you know, leap forward, and of course, it's part of every phone has GSM today, because it became from a European system to a global system, and now extremely efficient, extremely low cost. So the one system is not going to go away. It's, it's, every phone has it today, even a 4G phone has it today. And who were the pioneers of GSM? Well, many, many people. But I'd like to Thomas, credit Thomas, uh, Thomas Hogg, who was a Swedish person who was the chairman of the committee. And there was an enormous amount of politics because every country, uh, I didn't realize how big it'll become, but wanted to get their IP in. So there were calls made to the Prime Minister of England and, uh, and the Prime Minister of, of uh, the President of France, all into Thomas to try to make sure that their system gets technology, gets into the standard. So a lot of fights, there were many, many meetings where there were no decisions was not made. But in 1987, 88, they, they, they converge. Uh, Alain Malberti and Jan Osterdad, I know probably most of all of them. There's one or two more I'm left out. But uh, that was really a tour de force. JSM was a wonderful system. Uh, and it used all the latest ideas, and it somehow it all worked. And uh, so that was 2G, 2G, which has not only, which has remained in every phone since then. <coughs> So then we come on to 3G, and uh, uh, this is also an uh, interesting story. And the, this happened, it was deployed finally around mid, 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 mid around 0, 0, 0.4, 0, 0.5. But of course, all these things, when the date of deployment, the date of initiation of thinking is much earlier. This one was initiated uh, at least 15 years ago. And you go to 2G, the, it is probably 15 years, and you go to 1G, it is probably 20 years. So it takes a long time to cook these things to make them right before you can actually go to mass deployment, because mass deployment means rolling out infrastructure worth billions of dollars, and you can't be wrong, you can't get it wrong at that time. It takes lots of lots of cooking and and cleaning of pipes to make it work. So this is finally deployed around mid 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 thousand, and this is again this is now again looking for voice capacity. Increasing, because spectrum was very expensive. We know that, how expensive it is. So pushing through more voice calls was still an imperative. GSM had done a reasonably good job, but the idea was now to push it even further. And there was initial attempts to sort of saying data may go over the system. Nobody was really convinced about it, but data rate was also considered to be a fairly important thing. And what was the essentials of uh, 3G? Well, uh, it did a pretty good job of compressing the variability to the point that they could actually reuse the, the, the frequency in every cell. And they did that by using the concept of spectrum. So what they made, there was every, every, every phone call was made using a different spreading code. Uh, so I sort of showed it here. The total bandwidth of a certain amount, the entire amount was given to every cell. There's no division involved. But that bandwidth was then used in something called a spread, spreading method where in the entire time slot and the entire frequency was used uh, through a spreading code. And users had different spreading codes as a way to identify themselves. Originally, they were identified by frequencies, later by time slots, now by frequency and time together in terms of a code. And, uh, and these codes were quasi orthogonal. And since everybody uses these codes, they're all co channeled they all interfered with each other. So you had, instead of one interferer, or two interferers who, was, who could be fluctuating, you had literally tens or hundreds of interferers. So that made, uh, so if somebody was up, somebody was down, so that reduced the variability of the interference, because interference was very high, because everybody's interfering, but you had the spreading code, which could, which would push down, increase your, boost your signal, signal level by the simple spreading gain. So, and then they had to have fast path control. It turned out that the signal, uh, the signal, uh, the two, two, code, two guys talking to you were talking the same channel with different spreading codes, 
uh, they're not quite orthogonal. So when you see one of them, you'll get some leakage from another guy. And if one was strong, another was weak, it will cause a lot of problems. So you had to have I, you know, similar powers to everyone for it to work. So you need to build fast power control, power control. So, and the power control also re reduced the variability of the signal. So that actually brought them to a reuse one to a more spectrally efficient system. But I put a one by one star because you were throwing bandwidth at the problem, the spreading gain, so you're not getting this completely free. You had some, you paid a price for spreading gain up to a point. And the access to the users was called CDMA, code division multiple access, where every user had a code and, and, and they could access it by using the code. And this was originally, the ideas came from Qualcomm in 19, yeah, okay, the idea of, uh, let me talk a little bit history of this and it's interesting. And I uh, should go back to Hedy Lamar. I'm not sure the two hours or one hour there, but uh, she was a Hollywood actress and uh, came to US in 1930s, uh, escaping from Nazi Germany. And uh, for whatever reason, it's a pretty incredible story. She, uh, she invented the idea of spread spectrum. <clears throat> For some reason, she wanted to help out her, 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 her country with the United States against the, the, the Nazis. And she heard something about torpedoes, uh, torpedoes being uh, were controlled by wires those days, some, some torpedoes, and they could be jammed by, the, by, by an enemy. So she had the idea of saying that in communicating over a radio channel, if we jump the channel randomly across the multiple channels, and if the, the other guy, the torpedo, knew the same sequence, they could lock to you, and since you knew what you were doing and they knew what you were doing, uh, you could still communicate, but somebody outsider trying to jam you will not be able to get through because they may jam you as, uh, with, at some frequency, you would rarely hit that and uh, uh, you may lose one packet, but the other packet would go through. And uh, so she had the first patent in this area. And that became the, 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 became the source of technology for all, all secure communications for the military. When I was in India, I was in the Navy for many years, and at one time I ran a large uh, engineering group of 800 people. We have a lot of people who were building spread spectrum radios for the Army. So spread spectrum became a big thing and, uh, and very well known. <clears throat> so it turned out that, uh, so, so much for the, uh, the military part, which was certainly really started with, with her ideas. She finally died in 2000, and uh, before she died, I triply recognized her and gave her, her, gave her an award. <clears throat> Now, now let's talk about how what happened in, in mobile. Uh, Irvin Jacobs uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Andy Viterbi, I think Irvin was the previous speaker in the Lytle Symposium, uh, had a company called Qualcomm in 19, built in 1988, I think they started at 87. And they were working on uh, uh, military communications, satellite communications as a consult, as a, as a, as a contractor to the to US government. And, uh, and uh, they were not talking about mobile communications at all. And uh, as Irvin tells me in the story, at uh, one day he was, um, so when, when, and they were working on CDMA, or uh, uh, spectrum communications for military satellite communications. So the idea of uh, spread spectrum, the idea of power control were all well known. And uh, I mean, there were hundreds of papers before. In fact, at one point, there were people who said spread spectrum is the worst idea possible for mobile, never use it. So there are lots of issues going on. But what Irvin tells me is that, uh, that when we, one day after a contract meeting in Los Angeles uh, on, um, on spectrum for satellites, he, uh, he had a traffic jam in I-5, which still goes through Seattle, but I-5 between Los Angeles and, and San Diego, and he's sitting there for more than an hour with I think, somebody else with him. And uh, he began to think about applications of mobile just because probably maybe his phone ran out. And, uh, and then this idea of came to him about something called soft handoff. <clears throat> it was well known in the in the in those days in the early 80s, uh, when AMP's phone was still around. Very often, when you moved from cell to cell, the call would drop because the handoff was very complicated. Despite all of Amos Joel's work, it was still not uh, in perfect art. And uh, and the reason was that you would you had to switch, you had to break the circuit from your previous cell and make a circuit new cell. It, the, both cells couldn't transmit simultaneously to you because they were at different frequencies, and there's no way those radios could deal with that problem. But in CDMA, he realized that, that every radio, everybody can use the same channel because everybody can use a different code, so maybe that's not a problem. But moreover, uh, if, two, two, if two base stations send signal to you, they would arrive uh, at you, 
And in CDMA, there's something called a rake receiver, where uh, every uh, signal arriving at different delays would ap appear like a finger in a rake, and you can combine them. So the idea of combining multiple signals by rake was very easy to do. Well known, actually. Tom Kailath, another Lytle speaker, had, had probably perhaps proposed to analyze this idea in MIT in 1958. So uh, Tom was, uh, you know, Tom's ideas were very well known. So, but the idea of using CDMA for, for, for cellular uh, uh, attracted uh, Irwin because of the idea of uh, he can do this simultaneously, therefore the handoff problem might improve, and he called it soft handoff. And he went back to Qualcomm and I think got Andy involved with it, and, uh, and, uh, and different people in Qualcomm gave me a different story as to who drove it, but finally uh, Qualcomm became a pioneer in CDMA, and they had their own standard called IS-95, and I, I arrived in Stanford for 1991 this November, I began to consult with them in 93, so I was used to go and visit Andy quite often. I was pushing MIMO, but they didn't want to hear anything about MIMO. They said, you've got to make CDMA work first, forget about antennas. But uh, that's how it started. But uh, the thing with uh, CDMA was when the, they chose, chose a bandwidth of 1.25 megahertz. They did it for good reason, because they couldn't get a wider band. The wider the bandwidth, the better it is in CDMA, because you'll get more multipath effects. A multipath will arrive at the rake, and each rake finger would fade independently. You'll get more diversity. You compress the fading of the signal. That's helpful, as I, I told you before. Um, so that was going on, and the IS-95 got deployed and became CDMA 2000, and was fairly successful. In fact, they, they actually had a big market in India, and I was involved with the Indian company, which, uh, which brought in CDMA. But uh, uh, this was happening in the, uh, in the mid-'90s, when uh, uh, when uh, 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 Fumi Kadachi, who's not very well known, uh, but a researcher at NT Docomo, a good friend of mine, said, you know, let's make CDMA wider, five megahertz. Let's, let's forget about constraints in America, but uh, worldwide, and let's see what it does. And he found that uh, in Tokyo particularly, for example, he found that you can get real diversity from CDMA at five megahertz. You get multiple fingers or multi-parts, and therefore it was really a good system. So he worked on it, developed some prototypes, and then the Europeans, the 3GPP, the standards organization, decided to adopt it. So it became the 3GPP system, and uh, became and they went to five megahertz wide CDMA. It's called wideband CDMA. So of course there are many, many people. I'm sure people at uh, in UW must have written a lot of papers. You couldn't be a researcher in wireless without writing papers on CDMA. And I wrote some a lot of papers using antennas in CDMA. And some of those ideas were picked up by the Chinese, and it became the Chinese standard called TDS-CDMA, which, uh, which uh, I'm still in touch with. So, so I took the angle of CDMA and went, added antennas to it, but uh, the regular CDMA, I think the pioneers were certainly Andy and uh, Irvin Jacobs and then uh, Fumiko Dachi. <coughs> so now we come to 4G, and uh, the motivation, this began deployed in the early 10s, that had been two or three years ago, it really started taking off. The motivation was a completely new idea called MIMO, I'll talk about, and the need for, now, now data was needed, certainly needed, and you want to run broadband data, so uh, if CDMA delivered 100 kilobits, 200 kilobits, it's a big thing. We thought, what about megabits? And that didn't need to some other ideas, so this came from 4G. So before I go to 4G, let me explain a little bit of the technology behind antennas. <coughs> The, uh, if you transport from an antenna, receive another antenna, because of this multipath, you get this fading effect, which is a very deleterious problem. But what Marconi, back in 1905, in, uh, in, uh, realized that if you put multiple antennas, the fading at one antenna may be different from fading in another antenna. So if you combine them, you can, get, you can remove some of the fading, not get rid of them, you remove some of the fading. It's called receive diversity, it developed in 1905. You can flip the picture and say, okay, I have multiple transmit antennas and one receive antenna. Can I do something similar? Well, you cannot do, it's not so easy. But it took almost 90 years to figure out what to do. It turned out in 1991, uh, Wittnerbin is, is a researcher, is an engineer in a company in, in Switzerland, I know him well, uh, invent, proposed an idea called transmit diversity technique. But it was Sivash Alamuti who was working in a firm in Vancouver, I forget IMHR. Later on, the firm was acquired by AT&T at Redmond. So he was sitting here. 
who had a code, who developed a code which could do this, do it exactly and wonderfully, beautifully, and and you know, uh, efficiently. It's called the Alamuti code. <clears throat> you can, uh, there's some numbers I won't go into it. And when he first invented it, uh, had the idea, he went to his boss and told him that I have this idea, it seems to work. The boss said, show me the textbook where it's explained, because otherwise it's, you know, it can't be true. <laughs> so it's only when he got acquired by AT&T, the company at and t researchers in at and Bell Labs, like Rob Calderbank, uh, Savash told them about it, and then they said, this thing really is new, uh, and this really does work. So it turned out that uh, diversity code that he invented now is in every phone, every Wi-Fi router, every phone uses Alamuti code. <clears throat> Now comes uh, 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 another night. I came to Stanford in 1991. I was involved with some, I was a, kind of a postdoc, involved with some work for the Air Force through Dean Golub on interference cancellation. And some experiments I was doing uh, showed a lot of history in the web about it, showed something was going crazy. And from that came the idea of MIMO. And the idea was if you take a large bandwidth signal, you break it up into smaller bandwidth, send them some antennas, different antennas. And you can receive it, the receiving multiple antennas on the other side. You could, you could unscramble everything, put it back together. And the, and the, and the upshot was you could basically multiply the, the throughput. You multiply it like two, two by two. You can get the capacity, the power one could become two. And uh, if you have four antennas, it can become four. And if you have eight, you have eight. Today, four by four is available from Quintana. Three by three is, you know, most, most laptops have three by three today. Uh, uh, four by four uh, is in some home system from Quantana. Uh, it's also four by four is also available now from Broadcom and in, multi in, in Wi-Fi. The the cellular guys, my, my own chips in like WiMAX and LTE, most are two by twos, and uh, and eight by eight will come fairly soon. And you might say, okay, doubling bandwidth doesn't seem have a lot. Uh, well, uh, but let me talk thought experiment. Suppose you actually. Uh, use a modulation called 64 QAM, which is uh, eight. We get a 64 dot, eight bits per hertz. Typically used in all your phones and all your Wi-Fi. And uh, suppose you go to, I think, um, I think if you go to, if you go to four antennas, four antennas, 64 QAM, you can get certain throughput to the system. When you go back and say, okay, I'm going to get out of MIMO and go use a one by one system. Let's say I get the throughput, and let's assume I'm using one watt total, total one watt across all the four antennas. I'm getting a certain throughput of, let's say, 40 megabits per second. And uh, I'm, I'm so I'm, I go back to one antenna, I will only get 10 megabits per second. Now we say, okay, how about getting 40 megabits per second? It turns out that in this example of 64 QAM, how much watts do I require? I require a billion watts. You go, if you go to a little more experiment, like eight antennas, and go to, uh, go to 1,000 QAM is already becoming in practice, uh, eight, an eight antenna MIMO system if you want to replace that throughput with the one antenna system, you require more power than entire power grid of the entire world to make it happen. So it's a huge leverage. The answer is very, it's very hard to push throughput to in, 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 in systems of limited bandwidth and limited power. So antennas gave a way of doing it, so obviously it was embraced immediately, or not immediately. I, <clears throat> there's a lot of stories in the web about it. I actually, um, I proposed, you know, Stanford thought this is a very valuable pattern called almost all the wireless companies in the world, everybody said it will not work, they walked away. But it finally did take off, and of course, it's now today in every phone, every Wi-Fi router has, has this technology. And the basic idea there was to use spatial multiplexing, uh, just break the incoming stream into two, three, four bits in different streams and pass it through. It turns out that this idea, multiplexing and Alamuti's diversity idea, uh, that didn't increase capacity, it included reliability, this increased capacity, are in every phone and every router. A more, lot more complex ideas of codes have come, but they're too complicated to implement. So these two, ideas, everything uses either SM or Alamuti today. <clears throat> okay, so 4G, with that background, how did 4G happen? Uh, it was packet switch first time, we knew data was the important thing. And it uses uh, MIMO, of course, very important. And the big question was, can MIMO work with CDMA? Because CDMA was the darling technology at that time. Everybody was working on CDMA. I mean, you wrote an NSF, NSF proposal. Without CDMA, you'll get rejected. So I, uh, so I was involved with this whole thing. I'll tell you about how I got involved. Uh, but CDMA doesn't work with MIMO. And I had a bunch of discussions with lots of people who disagreed with me. But I felt it's better to go with OFDMA. And uh, 
And then we have brought some other ideas called fractional reuse, multi-use diversity, adaptive modulation, lots of new ideas. And the company which did that, put it all together, was a company called IOSPAN, which I founded in 1998. And uh, that company got inquired by Intel, and they call it Vimax. And Vimax then uh, went into some political problems, so it's still, it's still around, but not great. So then the 3TPPA guys formed something called LT, exactly Vimax technology. So LT is what near, mostly in your phones today. <clears throat> you, still, you might still be able to find Vimax routers, but they're not very common. And um, so the pioneers of 4G were really, started off with measurements in Stanford. This is, uh, I had set up uh, base station type antennas and uh, a CP, not really phones, but CPE type thing in Menlo Park. It's about two miles link. And I could take a one by one system from on the left hand side, inter signal interference to two streams above signal interference. It's very, very dramatic improvement. So that helped me start the company. It's called Iospan Wireless. I don't seem like very good photographs, but we developed all these ideas, and it was really the founder really became the core company of 4G. And uh, the IEEE bed medal came for the work I did in that company. It got acquired by Intel and uh, went on. <clears throat> but MIMO had, its, uh, had a life of its own. Uh, 91, 92, 92 uh, there was no, no take, but, uh, and I wrote a patent, but never published a paper because everybody said it does not work. And, uh, uh, you know, whatever reason was, I didn't push it forward in my research group. But 95, uh, 96, 97, some papers came from Jerry Fuskini and Mike Gans. Mike Gans' real contribution was, wonderful contribution was, uh, you know, with like Shannon theory, you had a very simple model, you can come up with an idea. Here, MIMO, everything was fading around. How do you put a grasp around it to build some theory around it? Mike Gans said, let's assume that all these, all these links were IID, independent, uh, you know, identical independent uh, variables. That, that gave a handle to bring in lots of beautiful random matrix theory. And so, hence launched the paper revolution. And uh, Mike Gans wrote some beautiful papers on how to code this MIMO system to get it to full efficiency. It turns out that none of the, and then later on, many more complicated ideas came, but none of them are actually used today because they are already, with simple ideas, uh, the, original, uh, the original pattern are hard to do, very hard to do. Uh, with more complex ideas, you get to entanglement, it's impossible. You need supercomputers to do it. So the, the, it's still, we still live on very simpler ideas, uh, and it most of them work very well. But, there are, but this launched a huge revolution. And, uh, and then okay, I won't put Sivash Alamuti there because he only wrote one paper. But his paper, his idea is there in every phone. So he's, he, he's now actually in a small startup company in uh, Mimic in, uh, in Vancouver. And uh, of course, we worked with them for many years. So, but uh, it, this thing really blew the top. Uh, there are today more than 12,000 patents in MIMO and 14,000 papers in MIMO. So, you know, 14,000 uh, uh, archival papers, perhaps, uh, perhaps an undercounted, and well over 1,000 PhDs. So it launched a huge revolution. And uh, so there are many, many people, you have all giants. So, but anyway, I had a 60th birthday 10 years ago. I'm 70 now. And a lot of people there, all these guys are there, but there are many more there who should be acknowledged. So this became a big, big area. And MIMO rescued comp theory because comp theory was considered to be dead in 19, 1980s. But this idea came, idea of MIMO and communication theory and, and information theory really took off. And many of you here have written papers there. So it was a wonderfully nice thing to happen. <clears throat> so where are we today in terms of um, mobile technology? Well. Uh, it's, uh, we normally have 100% coverage of the, of the globe. There are hardly any more subscribers to be found unless we go to Mars or the moon. And uh, uh, broadband is about 20%, smartphones, 4G. And the phones typically today are the Android or the iOS. Everybody else is very, very small. And uh, 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 Android has the biggest market share. And the, the uh, an infrastructure side was uh, Ericsson, Huawei, Alcatel, Lucent seem to be dominating it. There are a few others, but these three guys have the most, much of the business. Semiconductors, where I've been involved, uh, Qualcomm is now, uh, is now still has, has the high-end area of this business. Meritech has the lower-end area of this business. Intel is spending a lot of money actually trying to get into the business. And the, it's a, this chip is nine, milli, nine, by nine, 9 by 9 millimeter chip. Intel is spending today $4 billion a year to try and get into their market. So 
the amount of money spent in semiconductors is enormous, um, well over 10 billion a year. And so most of it's just mathematics and good thinking. So it's, uh, you know, it's a wonderful place to be an engineer in. And peak speeds, uh, you know, I mean, technically we should be touching 100 megabits today. I, people are claiming 200 megabits next year and so on and so forth. Uh, but, uh, it'll, uh, but it's already super fast as we know. So we've come a very long way. <coughs> so what about, what, what's the next G, it's the 5G? And um, uh, it's still somewhat hazy what's gonna happen, but I think uh, in some sense, uh, one, thing, one, one thing's clear, the target for speeds now is five gigabit per second. Um, LTE, the 4G will reach about 800 megabits per second and probably taper off. So we're looking at about at least uh, five to 10 times higher speeds, five gigabit per second outdoors and 50 gigabit per second indoors. You might wonder why do you need those speeds and the answer is that there's a good reason for that. The reason is that you could, uh, first of all, it actually makes for lower power because you can actually receive big files very quickly and shut, shut your phone down and you can also multiplex across many people. So it's better economics and power that is why it drives it. Uh, certainly, we want much better economics because data is very expensive, roaming, and I was in Vancouver and got a huge bill. So these things are still, we have to improve economics of, particularly of data. And of course, the focus is moving to applications. You know, we now have a good connectivity. What do you do with these applications? Mobile health, uh, certainly, and mobile cloud. Lots of things can be done with cloud. You can pick up the data and send it back to the cloud, get processed, bring it back. In you know, a mobile virtuality, reality, and uh, Google Glass, and things like that. So, application is going to be the big focus. How do you enable, how does the air interface enable these things properly, make it low power, make it cheap, and so on and so forth? In terms of technology, there are two, uh, apart from everything else happened today, you're going to carry all those ideas forward. But there's a two version, two uh, key numbers you've got to think of, key, key, key ideas. One is called large MIMO. Now, MIMO I talked about really was multiple antennas, multiple antennas, but you could, there's a version of MIMO called multi-user MIMO where multiple antennas can talk to, say four, four antennas can talk to four phones with one antenna each. You can't put too many antennas on a phone, so you can do it this way with one antenna each, four phones. It has some, side, some difficulties with it, but it does work. It's used in LTE today. But instead of, if a four antenna means four times, four times the throughput, what about a hundred? A thousand antennas, or what about 500 antennas? You get 500 times the throughput. So it's called massive MIMO, but you can't build a 500 antennas on a base station, it, and it'll collapse. So you can do that with high, 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 higher frequency millimetric band, where the antennas are much smaller. So millimetric band, they're called large MIMO, massive MIMO. Uh, is some work, is, a lot of work is going on. In fact, uh, I think leadership is really with Samsung. Um, and then, so for, and also we want to go to millimetric band as another band for, for cellular. It's not 28 gigahertz being looked at by US, but there are other people looking at, other countries looking at other bands. And the nice thing about the thing is that it's very, very, uh, you get a lot of bandwidth there. You're not talking about five, my mega, 10 mega, you can get giga, gigahertz of bandwidth, but there's a propagation problem. You, you know, the, uh, you get blocked by uh, foliage, the walls will block you. So uh, there's nothing wrong with, uh, with propagation. Since photons will fly exactly the same way they fly at one gigahertz. So, the, but, but there are some other issues by which propagation is not very good, but it's not a bandwidth. So these two are almost surely going to come into 5G to enhance the technology we have in 4G. But I think the focus is shifting to, to applications and things like that. <clears throat> so let me conclude. Uh, uh, from 1984 to 2014, just 30 years, almost everything has gone by a million times. Coverage certainly has gone over a million times. Speed from few kilobits, now we're not talking about uh, uh, in Wi-Fi, two gigabits, in cellular, hundreds of megabits. And certainly subscribers now have gone to, uh, I think real subscribers are probably about five billion today. Uh, but if you look at the number of phone connections, like I have phones in England and in India, is well over seven billion, the number of people on the earth. And so what are the next 30 years, the next 100 years? I think uh, it's going to be even more surprising, but it's hard to predict. So we, I think we're still only at the beginning. Thank you very much. <clears throat>